Hello and welcome to the Car Canada channel. Welcome to a brand new series on my channel about Toyota plug-in hybrids. We're going to go over how they work and how they evolved from this Prius Prime behind me going into the RAV4 Prime. In this series, we're going to cover the differences between plug-in hybrids and conventional hybrid Toyotas. But before we get started, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos, especially my series on how hybrids work, which I will leave for you right here. If you are a returning subscriber, well, thank you so much for watching another one of my videos. Without further ado, let's get right into it. So let's talk about the main changes, but in order for us to understand how the plug-in hybrids work, we have to briefly touch base on how hybrids work, regular hybrids. Now, throughout this series, we're going to try to follow a theme of my channel, and I emphasize the word try, to follow the theme of my channel of we're going to keep things simple because they're actually a lot more complicated than I might make them seem like. So having said that, let's review quickly how hybrids work. There's two electric motors, MG1 and MG2. MG1 has a direct connection to the engine through the planetary set. MG1 only starts the engine, charges the battery. MG2, which is the big muscles of the operation, drives the car. It also recuperates energy when you lift off the gas or you push the brake. It generates, MG stands for motor generator, so they could drive and generate MG1 in regular hybrids, only drove the engine to start it, acted like a starter, and generated power. It was driven by the engine to generate power and charge the high voltage battery. Now, this all sounds great. This is, by the way, the same technology since the first generation Prius, two decades ago when it came out. Life is good, they work great. However, this is when uh, Toyota brilliant engineers sat down together and they were like, hmm, we already have this hybrid car and it works great. It essentially has an EV mode and it could drive a very short distance at low speeds on hybrid power only or battery power only. Essentially, it is an EV car, but only for a very short period. Well, how can we turn this into a full EV where it has actual EV range more than a two minute less than 25 mile an hour range. And that's when things went crazy. Because if you think for a second, wait a second, if it can drive on EV mode on its own, well we could put just a jam a bigger battery and drive it and life is good. What's there else to change? Haha, here's where things get a lot more complicated than you think they are. Because regular hybrids, they do have an EV mode, but it only works for a couple minutes and it only works at 25 miles an hour. And these two things alone are the biggest difference between regular hybrids and plug-in hybrids. For starters, here are the problems. I want you to understand the problems that they faced when they took a regular hybrid and turned it into a plug-in hybrid. Problem number one, how are you gonna drive this car at higher speeds? And these EVs are rated to 84 miles an hour. That's a far cry from your 25 mile an hour EV range and regular hybrids. Problem number two, how is it going to have enough power now that the engine will not be contributing to the mix of power delivery? This car doesn't have enough power. If, you, if you've driven a high Toyota hybrid, a regular hybrid, in EV mode, if you punch it, even if you're below 25 miles an hour, the engine will come on immediately because now you're demanding more power out of the car and it's going to deliver by turning on the engine. So it had the combined power of both, but now when you're in EV mode, this thing will be extremely slow where it doesn't have enough power to really get you up to that 84 mile an hour range. The third problem they had, which is the biggest one, which is one that made them go to great lengths to design this car, which is possibly the most complicated part about the Toyota plug-in hybrids, the HVAC situation. I'm gonna call it situation. Because when you have the engine running, even if it's not running all the time, it's running on and off, on and off in regular hybrids, you still have the heat of the engine to produce heat for the cabin. Well, when this engine never runs, in the case of this Prius Prime, it's 25 miles up to 25 mile range. And in the case of the RAV4 Prime, up to 42 mile range. Well, how are you gonna make heat? And that's when uh, the world's most complicated car HVAC system came about. 
We're going to talk about that in a later part of the series. But for now, let's focus on the first few problems. In order for them to give you more power up to that 84 miles an hour, they had to change a few things. Do you remember when I told you in the previous series and even in the review we did today that MG1 only starts the engine, charges the battery, doesn't drive the car? Well, they had to change that. So now instead of you, ha you having only MG2 driving the car and taking all the heat and the stress with the engine on vacation because it's a plug-in hybrid, now MG1 also drives the car. But in order to do that, remember how I told you MG1 is connected to the engine? And if you spin it, it's going to spin the engine. That's just the way they are connected in the planetary. And because of your feedback as my viewers from my previous series on how Toyota hybrids work, we're going to actually show you the power flow or how the planetary works. And this took a lot of time to make it as simple as possible. So let's get right into it. Let's talk about the planetary gear set inside of any hybrid transmission, any Toyota hybrid transmission. They all have a planetary gear set. Everything is connected to it. But we're going to focus on the plug-in hybrids. Some of the models will have a different orientation throughout generations. This is pretty similar to the latest generation hybrids. So let's talk about that. The planetary gear set in the most basic form has three main components. There is the ring gear, which is the big gear on the outside. Then there is the planetary carrier, which is the part in the middle that has little gears that basically are engaged on the inside of the ring gear. And then you have a sun gear, which is a tiny little gear right in the middle, also meshed with the little tiny gears that spin. And this is when things will get potentially confusing. So bear with me here. The ring gear is attached to MG2. Indirectly, we're not going to get to the little nuts and bolts, but just bear with me here. The ring gear, the big outside gear, is MG2. The carrier, the guy in the middle with the little tiny gears, two tiny gears, that is connected to the engine. The sun gear, or the middle, is connected to MG1. Keep it as simple as that. In the planetary gear set operation, there is always a held member. One of the three is stopped by a mechanical force. So, Let's take a small scenario. When you're driving normally, not under heavy acceleration in a Prius Prime or a RAV4 Prime, the MG2 is driving the car. The engine is shut off. So that's your held right there. So when the ring gear spins, it's also going to spin the carrier. That, in that situation, MG1 will generate, MG2 will drive, and the engine, because it's shut off, it's just this big, giant, humbering dead weight, it's just going to hold the carrier while those little gears, because the sun gear is connected to those little gears, it's turning because you're we're supplying power to it, it's driving the car, and then those little gears that are spinning, they're also spinning the sun gear, which is MG1, and now that is being spun and it's also generating at the same time. So let's say you're driving in EV mode and the EV range runs out or for whatever reason the engine is about to start. Well, here's what it's going to do to start the engine when you're in motion. It's going to hold MG1. It's going to just park MG1 and hold it. So now the sun gear is not moving anymore. MG2 is moving. And now because that middle is held, now these little gears, they will start spinning the carrier, which is the engine, and now the engine will rev up and start. Pretty cool. Different when the car is not moving. When the car is not moving, MG2 is not spinning, so you don't have that force. And if you spin it to start the engine, the car will move. So here's what happens when that's the case. You want to start the engine when it's parked, when it's stopped. So MG2 is held by the weight of the car. It's not going anywhere. And it's going to supply power to MG1, which is the sun gear. It's going to spin. It's going to spin those two little gears on the, on the carrier. And because MG2 is held, the big ring gear is held, it's going to actually turn the carrier and it's going to start the engine. Pretty cool how that works. But here's the coolest thing that happens when you need dual drive. When you get to those higher speeds in EV mode and you really punch it and you, you're demanding more power out of the car, 
if MG2 was on its own, it would just stress out because it just can't supply more power because it's normally designed to have the engine supply power. So here's what's going to happen when, and they call it dual motor drive. So in the olden days, there was no disconnection from the engine. However, the way it drives the dual motor drive is it's going to hold the engine, spin MG1 backwards, and while MG2 is spinning the right way, that's going to, because of the way the gears are orientated, it's going to spin, and this is going to spin this way, and that's spinning inside and those little gears. It's actually going to create a torque, and that's, you have now both motors contributing to the final drag. Basically, you have MG2 spinning by the power applied to it, and MG1 pushing MG2. So now they're both working in teamwork, if you would. But there is one small problem. If they're both spinning, what's holding the engine? And because MG1 is spinning backwards, isn't that going to turn the carrier? Yes, it will. And it's actually going to turn the carrier backwards. So it's going to reverse rev the engine. So here's what happens in that case. They have a mechanical one-way clutch. If you turn the engine the right way, it's, the engine will start. But if you turn it backwards, this mechanical clutch will disengage and now you can turn it and it's not a big deal. It's held. It's not doing anything. That's how they achieve the dual drive. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the future we have this on regular hybrids where you can just have that zip of EV mode with both, both motors. But the thing is, you can't really do this effectively on hybrids only because they need that engine drive. That EV mode is such a short period that you need that engine all the time. But here's for, to keep this inclusive, when your engine is running, when the carrier is turning, it's going to assist MG2, just like MG1 did through this little gears on the carrier. It's going to push MG2 as well to turn, basically, because it's mechanically connected to the wheels. It's going to push as well at the wheels, while when these little gears on the carrier are turning, they're also going to start turning the sun gear. And that's going to start generating, because now it's turning MG1. And that's how this whole power flow works. So they had to make the dual motor drive in order for this thing to have an EV mode that goes up to 84 miles an hour. And since we're talking about planetary, let me say one thing. In an older video that I made on things you should never do to your Toyota Hybrid, I told you don't leave these cars in neutral for a long time. Here's why, now that we're talking about planetaries. So when you're stopped and the battery, and now we're talking about regular hybrids, and even, even this plug-in, because when it runs out of unit range, it operates just like a normal hybrid, nothing different. So when you're stopped and you're in park, that parking pole that locks the wheels from moving, that's holding MG2. So when it needs to start the engine, it's going to spin MG1 through the planetary, it's going to spin the sun gear in the middle, it's going to spin that carrier, and it's going to turn the engine. Well, if MG2, if you're neutral, MG2 is no longer held. So if you're going to turn the sun gear to start the engine, the carrier will turn, and it's because of these two small gears, it's actually going to turn MG2 and the car will start moving because MG2 is mechanically connected to the wheels. So you cannot start the gasoline engine when you are in neutral because the car will just lurch forward. That's just by design. So the problem is with hybrids, the why you should not put them in neutral for a long time. And long time is not for a car wash for five minutes. Long time is half an hour or more because the hybrid battery cannot charge because it cannot start the engine to charge it. So it just lingers there until it gets to a point where the charge of the battery, the state of charge drops to a critical level and the car just shuts off because now I really don't like this. And they cannot make the car automatically go in park because they don't know what conditions you're operating the car. Are you in a car wash? Are you pushing the car? Is this going to cause injury? They just can't do that. So that's why you should not put these cars in neutral for a very long time. But then there was a small problem that they discovered throughout the way. Well, now you have these two motors just full force driving the engine. Well, when they initially de designed things, they were like, hmm, 
we did not design this to, we did not design the cooling system to handle this kind of heat with two motors full force driving the car. So they had to add, actually in the Prius Prime case, they had to add an electric oil pump for the transmission. It's no longer a sling type. Remember I always told you, these don't have a very sophisticated cooling system, the hybrid transmissions. They just have basically a, a tiny little pump that takes the oil from the bottom, whee, th throws it up top and lubricates everything. That's all it does. In this, however, because of the higher demands and the higher temperatures, because now you have all these motors fully loaded to drive the car on their own, they have an electric oil pump that just supplies oil, circulates it very accurately. Now, the maintenance is still the same. It's very simple, drain and fill. But I just wanted you to know that this is another thing that they had to add to the transmission to make everything work properly. Then there is the enormous battery that we needed to put in these cars. So it's not as simple as just, oh, let's take this tiny little 50 pound battery and let's put a 300 pound behemoth in the back and call it a day. Well, there's weight restrictions and at some point it becomes counterintuitive. So you need, they needed to do a lot for the battery and not just only put a big battery. Well, how are you gonna charge it? It's not as simple as just plug it in the wall, plug it just like you do your cell phone. This is a high voltage battery. You're talking about 355 volts. If it's not done carefully, people will start dying and the losses will pile up and that's not good. So they had to really engineer that completely separately and really go overboard with it, which is gonna take us to the conversation we will have about the high voltage battery and the charging and how that whole thing is controlled in the next part of this series. Folks, I hope you learned something new. I hope it was not too confusing with the power flow of the planetary gear set. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I'll be more than happy to answer or clarify anything. If you like this video, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing. Turn on your bell notifications so you wouldn't miss the upcoming parts of this series. And until that video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and you have a wonderful day.